Hello, brethren. It is good to be with you again. We continue in our study and overview of the Old Testament. We have looked at the different sections of the Old Testament that they can that it can be broken into. We've talked about the fact of the 512, 5512, right? You've got the five books of the law, the books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch. We have the 12 books of history, roughly chronological order from Joshua through Nehemiah, uh, Ezra, and uh, remember Esther takes place between Ezra chapters 6 and 7. Then we have the five books of wisdom, which we finished up um, last week. And now we get into the five books of the major prophets, uh, which are followed by the 12 books of the minor prophets. Remember, major and minor is not so much uh, one is more important than another. It's more uh, the writing is simply larger. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Um, most of the minor prophets have less, significantly less. But So we start with the major prophets and uh, if you remember the mnemonic device to remember the books of the major prophets i just love eating donuts isaiah jeremiah lamentations ezekiel and daniel and understand lamentations was written by jeremiah so even though there are the five books of the major prophets there are really only four major prophets since jeremiah wrote jeremiah and lamentations but today we're going to talk about isaiah and obviously, it's a big book, 66 chapters, so all we can really do is touch the hem of the garment. It is a wonderful book. It is challenging at times, like uh, you remember our study of the Song of Solomon. Um, it is challenging at times because we don't necessarily know from one moment to another, from one chapter to an another, it's not necessarily chronological, what's being spoken of, because you'll have a condemnation of Babylon and all the things that she's done to God's people. And you might think, okay, well, that's prophetic looking forward. And then maybe a chapter or two later, he'll talk about Assyria is going to be punished. And obviously that happened before Babylon happened. So um, from chapter to chapter, it can be a struggle to understand uh, what the time frame is and what's exactly being addressed. In general, very easy to understand, but sometimes the specifics can be challenging. We have to be careful and not be overly dogmatic. Isaiah, uh, his name alone means the Lord saves. And what's interesting about that name is there are many variations of his name. Isaiah is one form. Hosea is another form. Joshua is a form of it. Isaiah, Hosea, Yahshua. And if you remember, that was our Lord's name. Joshua, uh, the Greek form of that name being Jesus. Jesus' name meant the Lord saves, um, as does Isaiah, Hosea, Yahshua. They're all basically variations of the same name. You remember often when our Lord would come uh, into a town, the people would meet him and cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Well, that Hosanna is a variation of that name, um, of Hosea. And it simply means Lord save. Instead of saying the Lord saves, Hosanna means Lord save. Save us. It's a request. So interesting name. Lord saves. He was the son of Amos. Who was Amos? Um, he was the son of Amos' mother and father, obviously. Uh, we don't know. We know Isaiah was a prophet of God. We know that he was married to a prophetess, to a woman who also prophesied. We read that in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 3. We know that he had at least two sons that had very special names given to them. The first one in chapter 7 and verse 3 was Shir Yashib. And Shir Yashib means a remnant shall return. And obviously that's an important theme throughout the Old Testament. Um, because the remnant has to return in order that God might fulfill his promise that through Israel he will bring the Christ. The second son that we know of, at least, had a, I always joke, this name doesn't roll off the, the tongue. His name was Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. It's quite a mouthful. And it literally means to hasten to the, to the plunder. 
Um, and that's not a good sign. That means destruction is coming and they are hastening to the plunder. And what that means is the time of Jerusalem, Judah's destruction is coming quickly. That was in Isaiah 8 and verse 3. Isaiah prophesied, we read, during the reigns of King Isaiah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. Roughly, those would be dates of 767 BC to 686 BC. Um, secular sources, Jewish secular sources, tell us that Isaiah was killed, put to death, by the son of Hezekiah, Manasseh, the wicked king, and that he was placed within uh, a log that had been hollowed out, and he was cut in two. Um, it's supported somewhat in, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and that roll call of faith, we read about the many faithful people of God that they were stoned, verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. Um, many believe that's a reference to Isaiah and the terrible thing that happened to him under Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. So that's a long period of time to be prophesying, uh, almost uh, 80 years. Um, but again, kind of comes here and there. We don't have anything, you know, one of the things that's ironic is we have five chapters of Isaiah's prophesying, and then in chapter six, we have his call to be a prophet. Well, <laughs> how did that happen? So just got to keep that in mind. The background, the background of Isaiah's prophecy, again, over about 80 years, the situation he found himself in were, were dark days indeed. If he prophesied roughly from 750 to 686, we know that in 722 BC, the northern kingdom was completely destroyed, never to come again. And the southern kingdom of Judah had almost been destroyed, but surrounded just the city of Jerusalem seemed the only thing to, that existed. Um, and then God spared that city, and 185,000 Assyrians woke up dead. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was forced to leave and go back home, where he was subsequently killed by his sons, and thus the threat to Judah ended. Um, but as if that wasn't bad enough, he didn't see the Babylonian destruction of Israel, but he prophesied it. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 39, <clears throat> during the historical bridge is what it's called. Isaiah 39, verses 6 and 7. The situation is Hezekiah has survived the Assyrian attack. He got very sick and was told he was going to die. He prayed to God and begged for more time. He received 15 more years. And then Babylonian officials came to him, probably to, interested in the, the country that managed to kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, but under the guise of saying, we heard you were sick and we're so glad to, to know that you're feeling better. And Hezekiah showed them around uh, Jerusalem, showed them everything, showed them his treasuries, the, all this stuff. And you remember Isaiah, the prophet, came to them and said, did I hear there were Babylonians here? Yeah, there were Babylonians. Uh, what did you show them? And Hezekiah said, I showed them everything. This is what Isaiah then prophesied to Hezekiah, beginning in verse 5 of chapter 39. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So even though Isaiah didn't necessarily live to see all that, he prophesied about it, so he knew it was coming. So again, dark days. A little more historical background. 
we know that Manasseh, wicked king Manasseh, was one of those that was carried away as a prisoner to Babylon, and he repented in Babylon and kind of became a good guy, but he had done so much wickedness that it wasn't, uh, Jerusalem was not going to be spared. So the background is he lived during the times when the northern kingdom would be completely destroyed and the southern kingdom would nearly be destroyed and the prophecy of the destruction of the southern kingdom would be by his lips and his pen. So difficult time, tumultuous times to live within. Um, let's talk about the book itself. Isaiah, he himself is called the Prince of Prophets. Um, because he was such a powerful, uh, such a, uh, what do they call that, productive prophet. I mean, 66 books is quite a bit, or 66 chapters is quite a bit. Um, he got to prophesy a lot concerning the coming Messiah, but his book has been called a little Bible. As the Bible is comprised of 66 books, Isaiah is comprised of 66 chapters. As the Bible divides up into two sections, the Old Testament, chapters 1 through 39, and the New Testament, chapters, not chapters, um, books 1 through 39, and then the New Testament, uh, 27 books. The Old Testament, judgment, condemnation, punishment, the New Testament, the Messiah has come, the kingdom and comfort for God's people. Well, Isaiah breaks up into two main sections. You have chapters 1 through 39, which are, we're going to see here in a minute, are mostly devoted, devoted to prophecy of destruction and judgment. There is a historical bridge. And then the last 27 chapters of Isaiah are all about comfort about the coming kingdom, about the coming king, the suffering servant of Israel, the Messiah. So it's kind of a little Bible. Uh, breaks down just like the Bible does. But let's talk about the, the breakdown more in more detail. The first 39 chapters break down into two main sections. Chapters 1 through 35, prophecies of condemnation. Um, the first 12 chapters, prophecies pretty much against Judah. Chapters 13 through 23, prophecies against all the nations round about. I mean, he literally goes in a direction all around Israel, condemning all the nations that have troubled Israel with their coming destruction, whether it be at the hands of the Assyrians or the Babylonians. Chapters 24 through 27, God's judgment on all the earth. So not just Israel, not just the nations right around Israel, but all mankind is being called to judgment. Chapters 28 through 33 are called the Book of Woes. And uh, basically a, a number of chapters similar to our Lord's uh, speaking in Matthew chapter 23 when he pronounced the woes upon the Pharisees. Chapters 34 and 35 God's judgment on all the nations. So are you getting the theme there? Okay, it's prophecies against Judah, prophecies against nations, God's judgment, God's pronouncement of woes, God's judgment. Okay, so, and then chapters 36 through 39 is a historical bridge. You've got basically three chapters, I guess it's four chapters, um, that give us a, a narrative of the historical setting is Assyria's, um, siege of Jerusalem, right? Assyria has destroyed the northern kingdom. It has conquered and destroyed most of the cities of Judah. Just Jerusalem alone remains. They surround the city. They're determined to destroy the city, and God spares the city. That There's a, uh, a narrative given there called the historical bridge. Um, there it's basically, it's not prophecy. It's not the poetry. It's just the story of what happened in those days. We read um, I read just a minute ago one of the last lines, the prophecy of doom. You've survived the Assyrian, but the Babylonian is coming. Then you get into the second section, and that's chapters 40 through 66. And their theme is comfort for the people of God. 
chapters 40 through 48, gives the reason for the comfort that is God's love, God's forgiveness, and the coming Messiah, the promises. Chapters 49 through 57, the person of the comfort, the suffering servant. And chapters 58 through 66, the means of comfort, faithful obedience. Uh, this breakdown that I just gave you chapter by chapter comes from the Truth For Today commentaries. Um, so that's a, a brief overlook uh, of Isaiah. I'd like to spend the rest of our time today looking at some sections of Isaiah. And you know me, I'm a, pro I'm a preacher, not a prophet, um, but I wanted to get the homily there. I want to talk about the problem that Israel was facing and that all people face. I want to talk about the prophet that God sent to Israel. I want to talk about the person who God was going to send to solve the problem. And then I want to talk about the prophecies of the kingdom. So four things we're going to talk about. First one, if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 1, the problem. Israel's problem and really everyone's problem. The problem of man. Look at verse 2, beginning in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. There's the beginning of this problem. God states it succinctly. He says, I raised up a people. Israel is a nation because God created it, and made it so by his promises, by his mighty hand, calling them out of Egypt, fighting all of their enemies, giving them the, the promised land. And the problem is, his people don't remember that. They don't care to remember that. Even though even animals know who their master is, Israel doesn't know who the Lord is, sadly. Kind of like what we read in uh, the book of Judges in the beginning. Uh, Israel was faithful to God all the days of Joshua and the elders who lived in the time of Joshua. But then there arose a generation who knew not God. That's what God is saying here. I've done everything for you, and, and you guys just don't even know me. <clears throat> Look at verse 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. So the prophet looks around and he says, and look at the state of Israel. We have been whooped and whooped and whooped. And, and then he puts it in better context for them. And if it wasn't for God being so loving and so determined to fulfill his promises, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah and completely wiped out. In other words, all this that's happened to us, we deserved it and more. Keep reading, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates they are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. 
Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. God says, who told you to do all this worshiping that you're doing of me? And Israel would have said, um, you did. You told us to do all these things. But as we see so often, they were going through the motions of worshiping God, but they weren't doing the things he told them to do. Kind of like Micah chapter 6, 6 through 8. Israel comes to the prophet and says, what does God want it to take care of us? What's it going to cost? And the answer is, he's told you what he wants. He wants you to love mercy. He wants you to take care of the fatherless and the widows. He wants you to love justice. That's what he wants. Now, when you fall short, he's provided you sacrifices and a means to, to pay for your sin. But see, they're just paying the price and saying, okay, then we can do whatever we want. Keep reading, verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There was the problem with Israel. God wanted them to be a people. And he gave them a sacrificial system to help cover their failures. And they took those sacrifices as a payment so that they could do whatever they want and they would not be the people that God wanted them to be. So just like in my case, says, what I want for you to do is to stop being evil. I want you to do good. Take care of the widows and the fatherless. Love justice. That's what I've always wanted you to do. And when you fall short, I've given you sacrifices to atone for that. But you are offering the sacrifices, saying, there, I've paid for it. Now I can do whatever I want. And even in the face of that, what does he say? Come on, let us reason together. I will forgive. I can wash you clean if you'll just obey, if you'll just be the people I want you to be. And that's why that's Israel's problem. That's all of man's problem. It's Christianity. It's not about the things we do. It's about the people we're supposed to be. And if we are supposed to be, if we are the people we are supposed to be, we will naturally do all the things that we're supposed to do. But sometimes people think they can go about doing Christian things and be considered a Christian. It's just not how it works. Sad but true. So there's the problem. Well, let's talk about the prophet that God was going to give to them. Chapter 6 of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. We sometimes miss what's going on there. King Uzziah was a good, good king of Israel and reigned some 40 plus years. He took care of Israel's enemies all around, and he was a good and righteous king. He stumbled a bit at the end. He wanted to worship God because God had blessed him so much, and the Levites said, Appreciate your thought, but you're not allowed to worship because you're of Judah. Only the Levites do the worship. He got it in his head and said, I will do what I want to do. And God struck him with leprosy and his uh, kingship ceased that very day. Well, apparently he died. Well, you know, everybody dies, but he died. And so we don't understand that for Isaiah, that would be a heartbreaking thing. Good King Isaiah is dead. That sure leadership for several decades is now over. But notice the contrast. In the year that King Uzziah died, oh, woe is us, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. And that's a great message for us always. Whatever goes on in our civil politics and our civil governance, God is on his throne. We don't have to, be desp we don't have to despair. God is always in charge. 
And above it, above the temple, stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Every time in the Bible, man comes into contact with deity. This is the response. Ezekiel threw himself down as dead, had to be pulled up by his hair. Um, John, in the book of Revelation, fell himself down like as if he was dead. Peter, when Jesus, after Jesus had performed the miracle of the great catch, you remember Peter threw himself on, on the ground and said, Lord, depart from me. You can't be with me. I'm a sinful man. Every time man confronts deity and sees that perfect holiness, man says, woe is me. I can't be here. But God, right? Those beautiful words, but God. Verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. But God is good, and he allows for the forgiveness of our sin. Isaiah is comfort. And then what happens? Then he overhears something. He says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And the natural response, what ought to be the natural response of mankind when God has cleansed us is service, right? We see how good God is. We see that we are not that good. We are remorseful, we repent. He provides a means of being cleansed of our sins. And then we want to serve, not so that we can be cleansed, but thankfully because he cleansed us by grace, he had been saved. Now, here's where it gets a little sad. Verse 9, And the Lord said, Go and tell this people. Go tell Israel. I want you to prophesy for me. Here's what I want you to tell them. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. That sounds terrible. God's message is, I want you to preach my word to them and they're not going to listen to you. So what I'm really asking you to do is make their ears grow really heavy and shut their eyes because they're going to stop. They're going to not want to see you anymore. And they will shut their eyes. I want it to be very clear that they are rejecting me when they reject your message. So you keep preaching. Remember how um, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Well, let my people go. 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 Oh, I'm not going to. That's how your heart is hardened. God just told Isaiah, I want you to harden the heart of Israel. And they're not going to listen to you. And what does this preacher say? Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Until everybody's dead and gone. Well, then let's just give up. No, no. Always, always a word of encouragement and hope. Verse um, 13. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Because of my promise of the Messiah, not completely destroyed. Do you remember the name of Shir Yashub? 
Isaiah's first son there, a remnant shall return. So there's the good news, that holy seed will stay and remain. So there's the calling of this prophet. And whew, brethren, what a task that would be. And it's not very different than the task we have today. Our Lord wants us to walk in his ways, to shine his light into this world, and to speak the truths of God to a people, to a nation, to a world who does not want to hear it. How long? Till the end. Till the end. Now, we don't have that uh, coming Messiah to look forward to, but we do. We have a returning Lord and Messiah to take us faithful home. So there's the problem of Israel. There's the prophet for Israel. Now let's talk about the person for Israel who's going to take away that problem. Turn to Isaiah 53. And there are lots and lots of messianic places we could go in Isaiah, but we'll just do 53. It's probably the most familiar. Understanding that this was written 750 years before our Lord walk the earth, maybe a little less, maybe only 680 years, but a long time before our Lord walked the earth. And what was written? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I mean, he did everything but say, and his name is Jesus, and he's going to be living in Nazareth, right? Just an amazing prophecy. And again, that suffering servant is a theme through the second part, that, the section of comfort in Isaiah, that there's going to come one who's a king, like David, hallelujah, who's going to suffer and die for God's people. Um, it pleased God, verse 10, to bruise him. Why? Not because God is some kind of masochist, but because God loves us so much. Uh, just as it pleased Jesus to die for us because he loves us so. So finally, let's talk about some prophecies of the kingdom. And again, we can find them all throughout this book. 
But let's just look at two areas. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. You remember the quick, quick rule of thumb about the kingdom, a.k.a. also known as the church. The prophecies of Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 were all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So look at uh, Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days, an, an often used expression for the messianic times, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Mountain is a figurative word that's often used to describe a kingdom or a great power. So what was said was in the latter days, in the messianic times, God is going to establish his kingdom and it's going to be established over all the other kingdoms. It'll be greater than all of them and all the nations shall flow into it. Notice it says, and it shall be exalted above the hills. And what that means is not only is it going to be exalted over Rome and Persia, and Greece, but it's even going to be exalted over little podunk countries and states. Okay? Verse 3, And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Right? Isn't that what Jesus prophesied? You're going to be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and then all the world. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The Prince of Peace shall bring peace to his kingdom. His kingdom is not going to be about fighting battles and having spears and swords. No, his people will be peaceful. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare, because we are engaged in a war, are not carnal, not swords and spears, but the truth. That's what we have, the law that comes out of Jerusalem. So an obvious reference to the church. And then if you turn to Isaiah 62, Verses 1 and 2. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. So, now we have... Zion is not going to be forsaken. It's going to be for a while, but ultimately it's not going to be forsaken. It's going to be glorified, and the Gentiles are going to flow into it. And when that happens, then they will receive a new name from the Lord. Okay, In Acts chapter 11 and verse, let's forget, it's 26. 26. It was in Antioch of Syria that they were first called Christians. But what was going on in Antioch of Syria that was so special? It was the first place where Jew and Gentile were worshiping together in the Christian system. And that's why it was there that they were first called Christians, there that they received that new name. So prophecies about the kingdom. It's a wonderful book, can't wait for the opportunity to study it in full with you, where we can go through all the chapters. Um, like I said, it's good to, to study with a reliable commentary in your hand, because again, chapter by chapter, who's talking, to whom are they talking, what's the time frame, what's the situation, sometimes it can be difficult. But uh, that's Isaiah. We'll begin next week with the book of Jeremiah. Let's conclude by going to our God in prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for the life that you've given us to live. We're thankful for your word and all the provision you've made 
we might know all things under life and godliness. Thank you. Please bless us and strengthen us. Help us to glorify you in the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love and miss you very much, brethren. Hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye.